Welcome back, everybody. How was your break? Did you get some water? Chance to stretch? Did anybody stay in their chair the entire time doing email? <laughs> and now you got to be in your chair for a whole other hour. Feel free to move around a little bit. If you've got to stand up and stretch, I will not be offended. Um, so now we're going to do a little bit of coding. If the network lets us, if it doesn't, it'll be more demo. Um, and that's one of the hazards of conference Wi-Fi. So from that perspective, uh, one of the requests is somebody say, can you just write this down as instructions for how to get the uh, files loaded? So I did that. So step one was to create an account at community.cloud.databricks.com. And step two was to click on home on the left. And then in your home folder, click on the downward triangle and select import and choose URL and import this URL. Did anybody need help getting that imported? You still need me to do it? Show you one more time? Yeah, I just show the URL to this document. Oh, where is this document? tinyurl.com slash spark dash kdd dash 2016. And if you don't know it, ask your neighbor because they do. <laughs> All right, spark dash kdd dash 2016. Either that or it's google.doc slash ubx2519. <laughs> OK. Yeah. You can just type in this big URL right up here at the top. How's that work? <laughs> All right. So now that we've imported it, let's actually look at this lab because I think this hands-on tour is really what's going to bring it home for you. So first of all, Let's talk about what this example is. Any electrical engineers in here? All right, we've got a couple. What is a peaking power plant? Well, that's very relevant in California back during the rolling blackouts. A peaking power plant is a power plant that comes on during peak times of the day. They're typically natural gas fires so that they can be started and stopped very, very quickly. And this is because the middle of the day is when everybody's running their air conditioning, the servers are humming along. It takes a lot of power to run California during the middle of the day, so you bring on these extra power plants. So our use case here, our data set that we're going to work with, is to predict the power output of a power plant given a set of readings. So we're going to look at the atmospheric temperature in centigrade the exhaust vacuum speed, the atmospheric pressure, the relative humidity, and eventually we're going to try to predict the power output. Now, electrical engineers, if it's hotter outside, is efficiency going to go up or down? Yeah. Down. Second law of thermodynamics, right? Your exhaust temperature is higher. You extract less total energy from your engine. Very good. So, how do we do this? This is standard machine learning. So step one, we got to extract, transform, and load our data. We're going to do very simple extract, transform, load by reading a comma separated values file. We're then going to explore and do a very simple exploratory data analysis. Truly simple with that. We're just going to plot variables against each other. And then we're going to train a machine learning model on top of Spark. So let's do that now. So, at this point, those of you who are going to try to code along with me should be have successfully uploaded into Databricks Community Edition the Power Lab. And the first part just describes the whole background of a peaking power plant. So you could skip down here to step two. Load your data. And our data is available in a bucket on Amazon S3. Now the Databricks product allows us to build a very simple file naming convention on top of S3 buckets to make it easier for us to reference paths to files. But this could just as easily be a path directly to Amazon S3 or Hadoop's HDFS. 
So we're going to try to read from Databricks datasets slash power plant slash data. Now, this time around, we're going to do it using Spark 2.0. This is, so first thing we want to do is come up here to detached and we're going to say create cluster. Create a cluster. And our cluster name could be anything you want. My cluster. And we get to pick the version of Spark we would like to use. We're going to have a little bit of fun using the Spark 2.0 API. Because if you're just getting started, you might as well start with the latest. Unless you're going to production immediately, and then you might start with something a little bit more tried and true. All right. And if you come down here to show advanced settings, Notice there's a couple of different options in here. For example, what zone on Amazon do we want to be in? So let's check the current Amazon spot prices just to reduce the chance that we're going to get priced out because this is the free version of Databricks. And it looks like 2B is currently very expensive. But the spot price here for um, 2A is relatively low. So we're going to gamble and hope we do okay. I'm going to choose U.S. West 2A for my zone. Of course, if we all end up choosing 2A, we may drive up the spot price. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and notice as well, you could choose the type of worker, community edition optimized, you get six gigs, but <laughs> less than one core. Hmm? Under the hood, what's actually happening is the machine has eight cores. You're allowed to run up to three threads on those eight cores, three tasks at a time. But multiple people are allowed to fight for those CPUs. And so it can get as low as 0.88. And, you know, you could choose all sorts of other little settings. We're not going to change any of these settings. And at the very top, we now click Create Cluster. And it should have started creating my cluster. What happened? My cluster, Spark 2.0, Advanced Settings, Zone 2A, Create Cluster. Right, I'll refresh my screen. When all else fails, refresh the browser. There we go. It says it's now attaching to my cluster. Now you guys may occasionally get, because of the traffic, some of the backend rest calls may hang going between the browser and the server because of the amount of traffic on our local Wi-Fi, in which case you just refresh and try again. But notice now it's launching my cluster pending. So I'll go ahead and let it start trying to connect to my cluster. And while it's connecting and pending, I'm going to start coding. Now, in Spark 2.0, the API has changed just a little bit. Everything in Spark 2.0 is queued off of this root object called Spark. And I don't know why my tab key is not working. We'll ignore that. Oh, it's because I'm not connected to a cluster yet. And so I can come in here, and I just want to read this RDD. So I'll come in here and go spark dot, what is it, get spark context? Just spark dot spark context dot, and I can read my text file. And notice I've got a little path up here. And I can read my raw text RDD. Now, for those of you who would prefer to copy paste, you can copy paste the 1.x codes sc.txt file. That will also work. But the newer style is to go spark.spark context. 
instead of just SC. Everything else is just copied from above, and we're just waiting for our cluster to come up, and then we're going to look at this text file that we've read. I should have had you guys launch your clusters during break. Is yours up? It'll take a little bit. What it's actually doing is firing up extra machines on Amazon EC2. So Amazon could take a minute or two to launch a machine. We don't have them, because they're free, we don't just have them sitting there waiting for load. We wait for people to come and then we launch machines on Amazon EC2. And Amazon could take about four minutes for a computer to boot. So right now, I have an RDD. Now if I was to run this code, what do you guys think? How long would it take to read a big file? Well, it would run instantly. In fact, I could go in here and make a file name that doesn't exist and I would get no error. Why? Because it's lazy. It's not doing anything until I say, show me the results. So I would actually run that if we were up yet. We're going to wait. So it's lazy. So how do I view my file? Well, if I want to view my file, I could go raw text RDD. I'd like to take the first five lines of this file, please. Give me back the first five lines of the file. Uh-oh. All right. No cluster. I come over here to, uh, so Reynolds, you're going to need to find me somewhere with low spot price. Can you? I should go to our own shard. You're right. For the demo purposes, because we're going to be fighting over Amazon spot prices, notice it says it was terminated due to error. Uh, failed to set access control permissions. What's up with that? That's not a spot price issue. Well, I'll just relaunch this, and then I'm going to go to my one of our company shards, my cluster, Spark 2.0, advanced settings, availability zone, 2A, create cluster. Let that try launching again. Meanwhile, I'm going to come over to my account. I have one up here, right here too. So I'm going to go import URL. Unless you want to give it you mean for everybody or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just going to import it. All right, so I've re imported my data set. And I'm going to go spark.sparkcontext.txt file and read in my text file. And then I'm going to call raw text RDD dot take five. I'm going to attach to a cluster I've already got running. So now I'm running in a professional version of Databricks rather than the free version of Databricks. I'm running on the enterprise version, which has significantly more compute power and doesn't get swamped by 200 and some, more than that, people all trying to start clusters at the exact same time. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and run this, except for the fact that community cluster is a Spark 1.x cluster. So let's launch a Spark 2.0 cluster. Up, oh, Brian 2.0, perfect. So I come back over to my cluster. Attach Brian 2.0. There we go, now we're in Spark 2.0. And run it. And notice what I'm getting back rather quickly. It says I ran one Spark job. It ran one Spark job because I called one action. And it returned me a list of the first five items. Now, what is this thing? This backslash T? Tab character. So it's rather hard to read, but I can see this is a tab separated values file. 
Can you guys see okay? Yeah, control, well, control enter runs the cell without moving to the next cell. Shift enter goes further. We just want to do control enter for now to run it. Now, I could, at this point, I just executed work, and what I've gotten back is a Python list. So I could go for line in my Python list, print line, because it's just Python. Take return the first five items of my RDD back as a list, and so I can just write Python code and print it. By the way, the solution is available, so you guys don't have to feel like if you don't type it in now, because uh, I know that there's the network issue. We came prepared for network problems because almost every conference we've ever been to, we hammer the network really hard. So uh, the solutions will be available for download as well. But notice it's just Python code of a tab separated values file. So the first thing I want to do is my ETL. I want to work through and process this tab separated values file. Now there are pre-built libraries in Spark specifically for reading a tab separated values file. But for our purposes, I'm going to show you RDD transformations and actions to do it at a lower level. So I'm going to move forward a little bit. And what I would like to do is take each line of the file and turn them into power plant row objects that have a field called atmospheric temperature, vacuum pressure, atmospheric pressure, etc. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take my raw text RDD, and the first thing I'm going to do is try to call and I'm deliberately going to make some errors in here, by the way. Very deliberately, because I want us to see error messages. So, let's call map. And those of you who go, wait a minute, you should filter first, you're right. We're going to call map. And I'm going to pass in a function. Well, how do we define functions in Python? We could do a lambda function, but in order to avoid using fancy Python functions, I'll say line to row, or line to data point make a function that given a line, this guy should return a new power plant row where the atmospheric temperature, and I'm going to put in hard-coded dummy values for now. Atmospheric temperature is zero, pressure is zero, atmospheric pressure is zero, vacuum speed is zero, humidity is zero, and power efficiency is zero, just for dummy data right now. And now I'm going to call map line to data point. And if I call take five, what am I going to get back? You know what? I'm going to go ahead and turn on the join me. It's risky. You're telling me don't try it. All right, all right. I'm being warned that that's just going to kill the labs completely. So if you guys can see it okay, all I'm doing is I made a function saying, give it a text string that represents my line. I'm going to not even bother reading the text string. I'm just going to return a data point with all zeros. And I run this thing. I missed a colon, thank you. Missed a colon for those of you who are typing. And this is small dd for rdd, thank you. And notice what I'm getting back now is five power plant row objects with all zeros. So, one of the, some of the typos I had to fix, lowercase rdd, and I needed a colon at the end of my definition. Now, I'm going to go ahead at this point, because I want to make sure we get to some of the other topics, do this more as a live coding demo. And I'm going to give you the solution notebook. In fact, those of you who would like the solution notebook, it is already linked right here. Lab solution files. I see some of you guys have already found it.
Now what I'm going to do is give it a line. In Python, how do I split up a line? How do I split up a line by how do I split up a line by um, white space? Line dot split. And this gives me words. And then I could turn around and go, atmospheric temperature is going to be a floating point of words zero. Vacuum pressure is going to be floating point of words one. Atmospheric pressure is a floating point of words two. Relative humidity is a floating point of words three. And power efficiency is a floating point of words four. And then I could actually just pass in those actual values in here. Atmospheric temperature, vacuum, atmospheric pressure, relative humidity, and power efficiency. And I want to run this thing. And I'm going to get an error. Let's find out what happens. I run this thing. And notice down here it says spark exception, job aborted. And I expand it. And we come down, and it's complaining. We have to scroll down a little bit further. Here we go. Where is the? I need to zoom out a bit. Spine spot. Here we go. Could not convert the string at to a floating point number. So what did I do wrong? Couldn't convert the string at to a floating point number. What's going on? The header row. I forgot to filter out the header row. So we come back up again. Zoom in. And before we call map, we really should filter out the headers. So let's call filter. And this time, instead of making a function that we ch I'll, actually I'll avoid using in lambdas just to keep life easy, define is not header. I only want to keep lines that are not headers. So I say if at is in the line, return false, else return true, or I could just say return at is not in my line. Nice, easy way to just filter out headers. So now I call dot .filter and say is not header dot .map line to data point. And now let's run this thing. And I'm going to have to refresh, it looks like. Because we're, it's the downside of any web application subject to the network. And it looks like the reason mine is slow now is it switched over to the hotel network. There we go. So I run this again. So now I'm filtering for lines that are not headers. And then I'm converting them to data points. And I'm letting my job run. And it says invalid syntax. Not, not no. Thank you. And now look, I have an RDD full of data points. An RDD full of data points. Now, I'm going to recommend you guys not try to code along for right now. I'm going to give you the solutions. I really want you to get what's happening and be able to see the screen. I think that's the most important thing, given that we're modifying what is normally a multi-day class to fit a very small lecture window so we can do the advanced talks. So at this point, we've got an RDD of data points simply by applying map and filter operations. What I want to show you, though, is I can go into this jobs view Come in here to this jobs view. All right, I'm just going to come up here. 
view Spark UI, that's even easier. And then we're going to go to the jobs view. And it said it just completed a job. And I'm going to click on this job and notice that there's a nice visualization. I have an RDD where I read a text file. I then apply map and filter. And eventually I get my results as Python objects. So I can see that it's a single stage job. Because all I did was narrow operations, a single staged job. I can even look at the event timeline and see how much time was actually spent on execution. And very little time was actually spent on execution in this case. Now, let's continue on. So at this point, I have an RDD of data points. I've done my initial ETL. And what I'd like to do is to begin analyzing my data. So we'd like to jump up to a higher level of abstraction. So just watch the demo for now because of the network issues. I'm going to take raw data RDD. And I'm going to say to data frame. I want to convert the RDD into a data frame and display it. And notice it's now giving me a very tab table-like relational view of my data set. I jumped up from what was a very low-level API of working with functions and partitioned data sets of raw objects. And I've imposed a schema on top of it that was inferred from my object structure. And I get many, many benefits by imposing a schema. One of them is that I can use a structured query language. And my internal memory representation can be optimized in a structured way versus being arbitrary Python objects in a pickle format. I now can use structured native memory. So let's do something. We can skip past this, and I'm going to go uh, spark dot SQL context dot what is it? Spark dot register table? What is it in Spark 2.0, Reynold? Spark dot SQL context dot create a replace temp view, and I take my power plant. Or excuse me, what was it called? It was called the raw data RDD. No, excuse me, my data frame. Where's my data frame? My power plant data frame. And I'm going to call it power underscore plant as my table name. I'm going to give it a table name. Oh, that's even easier. Power plant dot create a replace temp table with the name power plant. There we go. We're in our Spark 2.0 API. And at this point, I can say select star from Power Plant. So I just registered my data frame with a SQL name. And I now can run SQL queries, like select from Power Plant where relative humidity is greater than 50 or greater than 90. And now notice my relative humidity is greater than 90. It's a much easier than doing functional map, reduce, map, reduce. I can work at a higher level language. Now, what I'd like to do would be to just select star. And then I'm going to come down here. And I'm going to click on this little icon, this visualization icon and say, I would like to turn this into a scatter plot. All right, do you need me to pause for a moment? How many of you guys were actually keeping up pretty well? All right, I'll pause for a moment. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit fast because I'm trying to manage the time. All right, 
So how far back, those of you who are keeping up, did you get the create a replace temp view? How many of you guys were trying to keep up and you didn't get to making the power plant object in the first place? All right, most of you guys get there. How many of you guys got to create a replace temp view? You're able to do that. All right, not enough people, but I'm a little bit worried about pacing on the time. So I wanted, I'm going to give you this code at the end to take and run. So at this point, I'm going to say I want to plot, and I want to do a zoom out, a scatter plot, and I want to scatter plot all of my variables. So atmospheric temperature, vacuum pressure, atmospheric pressure, relative humidity and power efficiency, throw them all in here, and notice what I can do with some very simple exploratory data analysis now, if I find that plot that I just did. I can look at my table, and I can see, for example, how did atmospheric temperature impact power efficiency? So that's this square here, atmospheric temperature and if you were to look down, you'd see power efficiency was this column, PE. And I get a nice linear relationship between atmospheric temperature and power efficiency. In fact, if I scroll down here to power efficiency and we look at it, I have a very linear relationship with atmospheric temperature, a slightly linear relationship with, I believe, atmospheric pressure. And, oh gosh, look at relative humidity. I don't see any pattern there. It's very weakly correlated to relative humidity. And then there's this bizarre correlation with vacuum pressure. It doesn't look linear at all. I'm not quite sure what that relationship is. Could be inverse. But what we're going to do is machine learning and try to predict power efficiency based on this data. How did I get this? So what I did is I did a select on power plant, and then I came down here and I chose I wanted to make a scatter plot. That's all it took. A scatter plot. Question in the back. You got a what? Your tiny, your plot is too teeny. So that unfortunately happens in the UI. So what we can do is come over here, and there's a little kind of corner icon you can drag, and that makes it bigger. Little icon you can drag to make it bigger. Now, Reynolds, by the way, the example you ran, I think it's still broken because of the fact that the header line appears multiple places in the file. You can't just skip the first row. All right. So at this point, we've got a nice little exploratory data analysis. We could go through, we could actually do a lot more visualization. We could look at, for example, just atmospheric temperature and power efficiency. You know, you could look at individual items as well as a scatter plot if you really wanted to. If I come over here and click scatter, there it is. You could do just two items in your chart, et cetera. We could do all sorts of exploratory data analysis. Because we're running in Python, nothing stops us from using PyData and using Matplotlib. We could use matplotlib to generate these. In this case, they're being generated using the Databricks product on the D3 library, which is a JavaScript library for doing plotting. And as such, it's only taken the first 1,000 points because it's in the browser. And if you had 10,000 points, you'd crash your browser. All right, so let's finish using Spark here to do a real problem in our last 20 or so minutes before we get into some of the deeper topics. 
So now we're going to do machine learning. Now, I have a feeling some of you guys felt like you didn't get to catch up, you didn't get to type in, you'd like to see the answers. Go ahead and import the solutions now. Let's look at those. So if you've not imported the solution, go ahead and import the solution notebook. So it's lab solution files, and you're going to import it the same way that you did the lab itself. And so if you go to the original doc, tinyurl.com slash spark-kdd-2016, and you scroll down to where it says lab solution files. tinyurl.com slash spark-kdd-2016. <laughs> It works? No? Slack me this drink and I'll show it off. All right. I'm going to import it as well, in the interest of keeping things simple. Import URL paste. All right. Now, let's do some machine learning. Those of you who have imported the solution, by the way, if you've imported the solution, you're welcome to uh, attach to your cluster, assuming you're able to get your cluster to come up. And you should be able to then come here, and where is run all hiding now? They've, here we go, this little play button is run all. You click the little play button, and it'll run the entire notebook. This little play button that now looks like a stop button because mine is running. Now, while that's running, I'm going to go back to the lab. Where did it go? Power plant lab. And we're going to look at doing a little machine learning. So to do machine learning in Spark, so at this point you've seen RDDs, you've seen data frames. You've seen data frames through the SQL interface more specifically. I do want to show you one other feature of data frames. I showed you select star from power plant using SQL. What we can also do, if we wanted to, is we could use a more API-like interface. How many of you guys have worked with pandas? There you go. All right. So we could use the pandas interface. I could go power plant, bracket, power plant dot relative humidity, greater than 90. And then I could either call dot show, which gives me an ASCII version, or in the Databricks product, instead of calling dot show, I can call display. Oops. And if I call display, it gives me a nice HTML view. There we go. So this should make those of you who use pandas very, very happy. Now, some of you guys are used to pandas, and pandas has got a lot of other capabilities as well, like integration with Matplotlib using the PyData platform. 
let's assume for a second that by the time I've gone power plant relative humidity is greater than 90, that I have downsampled my data small enough to fit in a single machine. So let's assume I've done a huge amount of processing and I now have just the data set I want to work with to do plotting. And it's a small data set because I filtered so much data. I can call dot two pandas. And what I get back is a data frame, a pandas data frame. Now notice two pandas is an action. It ran a job and brought the data frame into the driver. So if you had gigs and gigs and gigs of data and you tried to convert it to a pandas data frame, what would happen? You'd run out of memory on your driver. Pandas is not big data. Sparks API, before you converted it into a pandas data frame, these were distributed. The moment you call two pandas, you've brought it to the driver so you can do plotting. This one here? Yeah. Dot show? So if I call dot show, it actually shows initially the first, I believe, 100. No, these are the first 20. Showed the first 20 rows. The one you said display. Display showed the first, it's a scrollable, and it showed the first 1,000. So it actually shows the first 1,000 rows. Now, there's some danger about my data potentially being biased in its sort order. So you might want to avoid that by actually doing a random sampling. So you can take a random sample rather and then display it so that you're not biasing for only the first thousand. Say again? Ah, so his question is, what happens if this was really big data? So that goes back to an earlier picture. Let's answer that, because I think this is what you really need to get from this entire class, is what's really happening under the hood. Let's assume the power plant data was huge and broken up into a thousand partitions. All right, I'm doing a very bad job drawing lines. Broken up into a thousand partitions. And let's assume that my compute cluster was not nearly as big just to make life interesting, I only have two, three executors. And each of those executors can only run two tasks at a time. So what's going to happen? It's going to load from the file the first partition, in, and it's going to run a task on it. All the, narrow, all the narrow operations get pipelined and run in a single task. So map and filter etc. And then it spits out the result wherever we told it to save the result. And then it's gone from memory. And it does the next task. Because I've not told it to cache anything, it's not preserving anything in memory longer than the processing of the job. Now if I told it to cache the data set, it's going to cache as much as fits in memory evicting least recently used. And what didn't fit in memory, it has to go back to the original disk and reproduce the state of that data when needed. Now there are other caching options where I actually say persist to disk, so that rather than going back to the raw data, it reads it from a locally cached copy on disk. And there's other optimizations built in as well. For example, if a shuffle occurred, it had to write to disk anyway. So it goes back to that cache. So what did two pandas do? Two pandas actually first went way back to the CSV file, because remember, cache nothing, did a map, did a filter, converted it to a data frame, did the query, then did a collect to bring all the results back to the driver. So now the results are all back in the driver. And then it took that collected result and it put them into a pandas data frame on the driver.
So if your driver's not that big, you cannot have a lot in your Pandas data frame. You can have a huge amount in your Spark data frame, just not in your Pandas one. So the only time you ever call to Pandas is when you want to plot, or you know your data set is small. Say again? The Panda call would actually cause an out of memory error. Oom. Out of memory error, because you brought so much data back to the driver that the driver couldn't hold it in memory. So when you run the job, when you call dot two pandas, it would throw an exception. Out of memory. No, it actually tried to read it all and it actually ran out of memory. <laughs> it wasn't smart enough to give you an error knowing it couldn't do it. Because remember, some of it is actually just running f arbitrary functions. And it doesn't know what those functions are going to return or their size. Only structured data can it do intelligent planning. And we started with an RDD, which was unstructured data. Once you get into a data frame, you now have some more intelligence. Um, question here and here, and then we can uh, get into the machine learning. Go ahead. How long is a cache around? Great question. So let's add some caching. So I'm going to come back to my code. Let's come back to my code, uh, wherever it's hiding. Workspace, home, power plant, 2.0. There we go. Power Lab. We're going to come back down to Pandas here. I thought I had a Pandas line. Scroll down. There we go. And what if I added a cache call? So I could go powerplant.cache. Now, that returned in a fraction of a second because it has not actually materialized anything. Notice it didn't even run a job. It says, next time you run a job, cache it. So I could turn around and go powerplant.count. And the first time, it took 0.7 seconds. Run it again, 0.1 seconds. Because it's all in memory now, 0.1 seconds. I can even go into the UI, I go view Spark UI, and I go into the Spark UI here, and I look at the job. Let's notice the job that was actually being run with all the queries. Because remember, I now have the original code we were doing with map and filter, etc. And I got to the point where I actually called cache on the data frame. And notice it's got a green dot, meaning that's cached. And then all the work after this is doing an in-memory table scan with whole stage code generation, which Reynolds is going to talk about, to do very, very efficient processing on the big data to do my RH is greater than 90. And then it's going into a second stage where it's shuffling some of the data and bringing me the results. So the green dot showed that I no longer had to go all the way back to the text file because it actually got to start here with the data frame that I cached. Hmm? Can I go back to the first time I ran this? Uh, it would not. So let's go back to the, for all, oh, let's see here. I think that's going to be a little bit tricky to isolate which of the job was the first job. Ah, here we go. Dot count. And all right, it's marked green, but it actually ran that stage this time because it's marked to be cached in this case. So it still had the green. But what we could have done is come up here to storage, and we can look at the storage, and where is our existing RDD? Here we go. Notice it's cached five partitions, 100% cached, taking up, in this case, just two megs of RAM because it's a relatively small data set. Ah, so there's a fair question. Where did it cache it? It cached it on the executor, which means the driver is going to have to be intelligent. 
is there an executor with the cache data available? I'll try to give it that task. If that executor is not available or it's busy for too long, I'll give it to another executor. So it uses a certain affinity based on cached data. I want to get into the machine learning. How do you guys sound about that? We're getting a little bit into the engine, which I think is really valuable, but I want to get to the machine learning here so that we can then hand it over to Tim to do even more advanced machine learning. So with that in mind, I'm going to go in here and scroll down to the machine learning part. So we've done visualization of our data. We've done data preparation. Now, oh, excuse me, we're up here. We've done it. All right, data preparation. So this time around, I'm going to take my table. And the first thing I need to do is take a relational table, and I'm going to attempt to convert it into features, a vector, a sparse vector of features. So I'm going to use what's called a vector assembler. Let me show you what it actually does. So I'm going to run this cell on the next cell. So vector vectorizer dot transform, whoa, no pointer exception. That was unexpected. What is null? Oh my. We may have a Spark 2.0 error. Oh, input calls is none. That's why. Input calls needs to be atmospheric temperature, relative humidity, atmospheric pressure, vacuum speed, but not power efficiency. That's an output column. So I'm going to take just those four columns that I want to input and run it. And what did it do? It took those columns and created a new column called features that is a sparse vector a sparse vector of features. This is actually a little bit better shown using dot display. So let's call dot show. Dot show. There we go. What you see here is a vector of features. So I'm extracting features out of my data frame and it simply adds a new column. So what was that code again? New vectorizer, set input columns, gave it the column names, and I said, I want you to make a new column called features that has the vector. All right. Now, we can start working with our data. So we've got our data set, and being good data scientists, we'd like to train on 80% and do validation on the last 20% of my data, being good data scientists, so that we can detect overfitting and find out how good our model really is. So I'm going to take my data set and say, I want you to give me randomly 80% of my data. Now, I'm going to get rid of this line here that says seed for a minute. And I'm going to call training set dot count and test set dot count. And notice this time around, the test set was 9,562. I run it again. This time, 9,614. Run it again. 9,503, what's going on? Well, the algorithm to do random sampling in a highly parallel fashion is each executor just goes to its portion of the data and rolls dice. Up, oh, you scored an 80, you're in. Up, oh, you scored a 20, you're out. Rolling the dice. So it's not a perfect 80-20 split, rather I'm just 80% that you're in this set, 20% chance you're in that set. Well. Remember what I told you about Spark. If you cache the data and then the cache is lost, it reruns the previous code to regenerate the data? Well, we've added an element of randomness, 
meaning if I lose the cache, it might randomly assign the point to a different part. That would be bad, right? Randomness destroys the resilience of the RDBs because I can't reproduce the data exactly as it was before. There's non-determinism. So what I'm going to do is just specify a random seed of my choosing. I will choose the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, 42. And now I run this code, and notice I get the same number of lines each time. And at that point, I can cache them. And I really don't want to cache anything before this. Because before this, I was just doing plotting. But now I'm about to do an iterative machine learning algorithm. Now caching matters. You want to wait and cache only the data you're going to use a lot. Because otherwise that cache data is fighting all the other cache data for memory space. So I'm going to cache my training set and my test set. You guys still with me? And we're going to do linear regression. So we are going to create a new linear regression model estimator. And we ask it, what are the inputs to linear regression that we can use? And it says, I don't know if you can read this terribly clearly on these big monitors, which column has our features? Which column has the label that we're trying to predict? Do we want to do regularization? When I do predictions later, where should I put the result? How many iterations am I willing to go? And in this case, in order to scale, Tim's going to talk more about it, it's going to do an iterative gradient descent. The closed form solution of linear regression is great for small data. Closed form, you just invert a matrix, do a couple of matrix multiplications, and you get a solution. But for big data, matrix invert is what? N cubed at the sides of the matrix? Big O of N cubed? So we need a much more scalable algorithm. So we're going to just do gradient descent to solve it. So we set the maximum number of iterations. You could even, if you wanted to, do lasso or elastic net, changing your L1 norm to an L norm or any other value if you were doing ridge regression. All right, so those are our parameters. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say, I want to read, so let's come in here, dot set features call to be features. So I'm going to read the features and the label, PE, iterate a thousand times, and I'm not going to bother with the regularizer. Regularization is zero. Why am I not regularizing? Because I didn't bother to standardize my data first. So I'd be penalizing things with big constants. And at that point, I can create a pipeline. So I could say, given your data, first I'd like to use the vectorizer, and then I'd like to use linear regression. And I'd like to take my training data and train a model. So I run this thing. It says unexpected indent because I'm inconsistent in my indent. No, because I'm missing a backslash. There we go. Notice it ran five jobs. One job per iteration. Data parallel. So in parallel, it's able to do that step of the gradient descent. And then it ran that job five times until it converged. And now we could actually go and take a look at our results. So I could say, take my test set, apply the model to my test set, and give me the predicted power efficiency. And you can see the predictions aren't that far off from the actuals. Fair enough. So what runs in the executors and what runs in the driver? 
So the driver is like the quarterback. It calls the play and says hike. The actual carrying of the football is done by the linebackers and everybody else, and those are the executors. So all the real compute work is being done on the executors. That's where the RDDs live. They get materialized on the executor. The driver is simply doing the planning and showing the results. That's it. It does the planning, and it shows the results. The executors are where the real work is happening. But then in the example you showed previously, the pandas part. The pandas part was done on the driver because we're no longer working with data frames anymore. We're working with pandas. We're not working with Spark data frames. Good question. All right, so now let's do some validation here. So we'll come down here a little bit further. Question. Yeah. What does stages do? Which one? SES stages. SES stages. Where are you seeing that? Oh, okay. So I'm creating a new pipeline. So what is a pipeline? How many of you guys work with scikit-learn? That's a pipeline. So the first stage of my pipeline, take my data frame and vectorize it. Second stage of my pipeline, take the vectorized data and do linear regression. So let's say I wanted to add standardizers. So I could come up here. Where's my import statement? Um, do you remember the PySpark package off the top of your head for the standardizer? PySpark did ML dot. It would be up here with vector assembler. There we go. Feature. So if I wanted to add standardization to my pipeline, I go and say, standardizer, and then STD equals standardizer, and I could add that into my pipeline before doing the linear regression. So I'm saying first, grab the features, standardize the features, do linear regression, one, two, three. So set stages is simply saying, what do I want to do? And it's not called standardizer. What is it called? Am I misspelling it? Oh, I'm just misspelling it. Thank you. Can't import name standardizer. PySpark standardizer. Just got to get the package name right. Spark did MLLib dot feature. PySpark did MLLib dot feature. I thought that's what I imported. PySpark dot MLLib dot feature. It can't be right. PySpark standardize. Yeah, we'll look it up. There's normalizer, standardizer, and a couple of others. Standard, standard scalar, that's what it is. Standard scalar. So we come back and we import standard scalar. And then we'd have to set the input columns and the output columns, set input column to be features, and the output column to be set output call, standardized features. And we'd have to change this guy to now read the standardized features. And there's probably one other value. Oh, there we go. Ran six jobs, and it's now actually standardized in the middle of it. So it, the linear regression was working now on the standardized features. So I could actually do a proper ridge regression if I wanted to. Does that answer your question, what set stages is doing? I'm setting stages in a linear regression pipeline. I would normally build up a lot more of the theory, but I'm trying to give you a very compressed two-hour overview of what it takes to work in Spark. Are we accomplishing that goal? Do you guys feel like you can go and start coding Spark immediately? Very hard to do in only two hours. We have a three-day class on just Spark for ML. 
That's a very good class too. I highly recommend you go to the website and sign up. But uh, back to, and we also have some MOOCs on it as well, some very good MOOCs that are free. But this is setting stages, so now I, I extract my features, standardize my features, do machine learning, just like in scikit-learn. All right, now I can come all the way down, and if I wanted to, I could actually start getting the, use what's called regression metrics, and I can actually read the root mean squared error, the explained variance, etc. So my root mean squared error is four, my R, st R squared is 0.92. Not too bad of a fit. Ah, great question. So if you were running scikit-learn, like if I just started calling scikit-learn right here, that would be running in the driver. Now if I put this call to scikit-learn inside of a function that's called a map, so I go rdd.map, and I pass it a lambda that calls scikit-learn, now that's running on the executor. And I have an example, actually, I can put up online, show you a little bit afterwards, after Tim's talk. I'll, show you, I'll upload an example of calling scikit-learn to do grid search in parallel. But what we're doing here is data parallel. One training job splitting the data set up across many machines. The other thing we could do would be to just train many models in parallel, each with different hyperparameters on a much smaller data set. And I'll show you an example of that later on. But the MLLib library that we're using here is data parallel. So that we can work on big data rather than big machine learning. And I don't know if you're covering any of the big data parallel type uh, stuff in your talk here. So we're actually post due for a break and I'm cutting into Tim's time, so I'm going to leave you with one last plot. And zoom out. And what you see is that my deviation is in fact normalized. So I do have a nice standard curve of the error from my prediction. Although there's this long tail, which would be worth exploring. Why are there these data points that just don't fit the model? Be worth exploring. Maybe there's another input variable that we've missed. All right, how was that for a really crash course on Spark? Excellent. All right, Tim is gonna be up and talk about the algorithms after 10 minute break. See you guys in 10 minutes here.